Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. yes. Great. Okay, so welcome to my talk, everyone, on authentic approaches to foster diversity and open source. So this talk um, will mainly be focusing on once you've gotten your diverse talent in your project, your team or your workforce, how to actually retain them long term, how to keep them around and make them feel welcome. So um, what we'll be covering, I'll start saying a little bit about who I am uh, and what I've been doing and why I'm standing here today. And we'll look into what the free the three pillars of diversity, equity, and inclusion is and what it means. And we'll then I'll tell a story about my first introduction to how I think it can be done right, um, how you can have an event or a workforce that makes you feel included. Um, then I'll look at some perspectives from things I've gathered over the years, talking to other people in minority groups, and that will go into some ch tips that people can actually implement today, no matter the size of their project or their team, to actually make people from diverse backgrounds feel wel welcome in a longer term. So who am I? That's a very good question. Many people have probably seen me walk around and walk into things. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a fully blind software engineer from Denmark. My name is Jessica. And um, I do mostly open source. I barely know the, the, the term closed source. I've always worked on open source ever since I started coding all the way to 14 years later when I'm standing here. I'm an open source maintainer of PyPandoc, a Python wrapper around the document conversion tool Pandoc, which takes Markdown and converts it to and from basically any, any format on the planet. In last year, I was a part of GitHub's accelerator program where they took 20 projects and tried to find new sustainable ways to financially sustain open source. Other than that, I did a internship with Uber over the summer where I worked on their autoscaler for their Kubernetes platform to scale up and down their services based on load and peak hours. And lastly, I've done a bunch of conference speaking. I was at Bilbao for the Open Source Summit Europe last year. I'm here now, and then next month, I'll be going to PyCon US, where I'll be giving a talk there as well. So we probably already, all, we, all of us have probably heard diversity, equity, and inclusion before, or it's abbreviated term, uh, DEI. But what does it actually mean? So. Um, diversity. Diversity involves all the ways that people are different. So that's what makes them stand out for the majority of society, such as disability, race, gender, um, religious, or, or sexual orientation. The important thing to note that diversity can actually mean something different depending on what industry you're in. As an example, in tech, women are, are considered a minority group, whereas in hospitality, men are actually often considered a minority group there. Equity. So equity aims to identify and remove barriers that are for having equal uh, opportunity and potential for advancement in any given work workforce situation. So to promote uh, equity, people typically focus on the underlying causes that make um, society be in, unequal. So the difference between stuff, a word like equality, a term like equality and equity is that equality means that every individual has the same resources and opportunities and and that's the kind of basis, whereas equity recognizes that anyone and everyone in here has different um, resources available and we are supposed to be adjusting so we can make the same amount of work and produce the same kind of result. Oh, there we go. 
Um, and lastly, inclusion. That's probably what most people have heard of when they grew up or throughout their career. Inclusion means actually building your community to where everyone feels welcome and included. Kind of self-explanatory, but I thought I would go over it anyway, just in case. So. So my first story is with a positive experience with diversity and inclusion and also to a part equity was when I started at university. When I started, I thought it was gonna be my, like my last university where everyone only saw me for my disability instead of actually recognizing me for everything I've done, everything I have potential to do, and recognizing me as the young adult that I, that I was. That can be a very good example for, for like individuals and we, that we all can do something to make even the most shy or silent person feel included or welcome. And the main point there was that they made me feel welcome without actually focusing too much or too heavily on my disability, only assisting me when I actually asked for help. So the other was that back in 2022, a lovely lady from Uber reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to join their She++ event. It's a event they host for women in tech at their offices to get to come and know them um, and meet other young women in tech. And that sounds very much like a recruitment um, event, but that it was much more than that, which I very quickly figured out. They taught me very valuable skills like the salary negotiation, something that we know in the tech industry that women are lacking behind on and therefore typically gets a lower salary than our male counterparts. They also weren't too focused on having us specifically join them. They did it mostly for the community and so they could actually see us thrive later on. Another way I also figured that out was that they didn't have any media or PR coverage at the event, something they very easily could have done to get some quick good press. But instead of doing that, they chose to focus solely on us and what we needed, and that's how they also were really good at accommodating extra requests, such as people with disabilities or people with kids and so on and so forth. So, so the perspectives I've heard a lot when talking to people, both in my own minority groups, be, being blind and in other similar ones, are that there are some fears that go throughout the communities um, that kind of intersects into these, which is, excuse me, being a diversity hire. So basically just being hired for your disability and not because you bring something valuable or not because you are the best qualified candidate. That's typically done in companies that are only doing DEI to fill quotas and not actually to, because they want a diverse workforce. It's typically very easy to spot by people having the same amount of, let's say, women in their teams, like if there's 10 teams with five people in each team and there's exactly one woman in each, that's a very good indication that they only put the teams together in such a way to fill a specific quota, like 25% or 20% women in every team. Because that looks good on paper, but in practice, it's not really very practical. In that, and to go into that, that also carries with it a lot of imposter syndrome. Whenever I interview for a company position or whenever I've heard mo many other people interview, they always think, well, are they only offering me the job because they need to, because uh, of the boxes I tick, or do they actually offer me the job because I was the most uh, qualified candidate? Um, Another really good way to see if a company truly believes in their diversity and equity and inclusion mission is to look at higher management or leadership. 
this also goes for companies or like this also goes for smaller projects with a few maintainers as well. Um, such as like if they have women on their leadership team, if they have people of color or people that are disabled on their leadership team, that means that people are not just seen as numbers, but they are actually just as capable and approach to, to go higher up in, on the ladder as well as everyone else. By seeing this in a leadership, that can actually really help to alleviate both the fear of being a diversity hire and the fear of, um, of imposter syndrome. And on, on the reverse, if you don't see it, that it's probably not going to make you stick around for long. Imagine that you don't really can relate to anyone in your higher management or your manager. That's probably not going to make you want to stick around for very long. So with this in mind, I have compiled a list of tips both for smaller projects and for bigger teams and organizations that I see go again from many people asking what they can do for inclusivity or diversity. So for smaller teams and projects, have inclusive language that goes across the readme, the documentation, goes in the communication from the maintainers and throughout the community. It's simple things like avoid, obviously, jokes at the expense of diversity or of minority groups. I avoid stuff like gender language when it's not necessary, of course. Um, another thing is lower the barrier to entry. So easier documentation, easier to get started. Make it very simple. Use something like Docker to, if you're using a technical project, use something like Docker to just say, run this single command and then it all works and you can start developing with us make it easy to find the documentation and make it easy to navigate throughout the documentation. A good example of this, if people want to look that up later, is widgets, the Python widgets binding, WX Python. Their documentation is super easy to navigate. They have a search field that can loosely search on everything you need, so you just need to loosely know what you're looking for and it can probably help you find it. Open communication make um, your decisions as a leadership team, make that in the open so people understand your thought process. Don't have secret um, decisions that you don't tell your community and don't tell part of your maintainers. And yes, I have seen that before. And a very big part is it is, as I said before, accessibility. Make it easy to get started, make it easy to set up and make it easy to know where to go if you have questions or want to contribute. For bigger teams, the, teams, the, the tips for smaller projects still apply, of course. But for teams or organizations, another thing is financial support for, yeah, for aid, for travel fund, for people to go and either go to conferences like these or to get training or certification that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get. Um, bug bounty programs, if you're like a, a open source project, that's a very good way of encouraging people um, because we all like money. And as I also touched a little on earlier, have a diverse leadership team. because like lower people or like more junior um, contributors will leave or will not see, see it through if they can't see themselves be heard in leadership. And that goes both for organizations as well as open source communities and nonprofits, foundations and so on. Another really good way is mentoring. If you have a diverse workforce, then having someone to actually show people how it works and show people that they are welcome. Have a direct line of like from a junior to someone that's more senior. A good example of this was I had a mentor at Uber. Every intern had this, but I felt like I was hurt more because my mentor actually worked there and knew who to go to and when to go to who. 
And a really good, really good example of that is in open source projects, if you have a mentor, more often than not, they can help pull new junior contributors into the project. Another good example of that is I, um, I regularly get mentoring from the people at GitHub because I was a part of their accelerator program. And I also get mentoring at various places in the Python community. Another way is for bigger organizations and foundations to reach out for, to organizations specifically for people that, um, for minority groups, like disability organizations. I know uh, the only one I know personally myself is in the US, they have the National Federation for the Blind that does a lot of accessibility work. Um, on that note, the Linux Foundation also does great and they're the whole reason I'm able to stand here and give this presentation in front of it, you all. And lastly, the networking events, just like C++, the Uber event that I talked about earlier, gather people from specific minority groups so they have a forum to discuss um, what they go through, can relate to each other, no matter the level, if they're senior or junior, if they just joined or have been with your team for over 10 years, it's always valuable to hear new perspectives. And of course, also the diversity lunch we had earlier, the women's lunch we had two days ago, are also great examples of this. So in closing notes, I know if we keep those tips in mind that I listed, I think we're all gonna do very well. I think that people are going to stick around with what they choose to pursue because they feel welcome and appreciated. Of course, don't be afraid to ask. I know many people has done that with me. They asked how I'm doing half of the stuff I do on the computer, how I am standing in front of a crowd I can't see and giving a talk, and how I do coding, how I walk around outside. But that's simple questions to me, but people that can see normally never consider that there's a whole world out there where people see differently or where people just like experience the world differently due to other sensory um, disabilities, both visible and invisible. Be opening to experimenting many things you're not gonna get right on the first try. Let's, there's no set handbook for how you're supposed to do things. There is tried things that work in the past and nine times out of 10 people that are in a marginalized community, they already know what those are, so just ask questions. And lastly, be flexible to try something new, to yeah, experiment, because we will not get it right on the first try, but as long as we keep trying, that is what counts. And lastly, we are at Q&As, where we can take a few minutes for questions, if anyone has any. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs>